Get started. We've got Dave here. He's yes. our former vice president and currently the PR director for American Atheist. Ow! Yes. Woo! Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. So today I'm going to be speaking about the historical reliability of the New Testament. Um, specifically, we're asking, is it historically reliable? Uh, we're going to be using something called the historical critical method, which I'll talk about here in a second. My name is Dave Moscato, uh, like Tony said, I'm the Book Relations Director for American Atheists. If you'd like copies of these slides, please email me, uh, dmoscatoatheist.org. I'm happy to send that to you. Um, I have a YouTube channel and I'm on Twitter. If you want to follow me there, you're certainly welcome to. So, is New Testament historically reliable? Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> So, no, in all seriousness, though, um, the first thing we need to do in order to answer this question is to find some of our terms. So, what do we mean when we say the New Testament? Well, it's the second half of the Bible. I think most of us know that. Um, if you Google, you know, definition of New Testament, this is what you get. Uh, it's the collection of books of the Gospels, Acts of the Apostles, the Pauline other epistles, and Revelation, composed soon after, I'm going to say, Jesus' death rather than Christ's death, uh, and the second half of the Christian Bible, like I was saying. So, uh, gospel it, it just means good news in Greek. Um, Acts are the books that detail what the apostles did after Jesus died. Uh, epistle, it, it just comes from Latin, where peace to love, which means letter. Those are just letters that they wrote. Uh, and Revelation talks about the end times. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much what we're talking about today. As far as the question, is it unreliable? Unreliable, if you just Google this, it just means undependable, reliable, to be erroneous or misleading. So what I want you to notice about that is it's not a yes or no thing. Uh, I mean, something can be partially reliable, and that's okay. It just means that it, it's less dependable than it might otherwise be, and it's liable to make you believe things that may not be true. So as far as the historical critical method, which is what we'll be using to do this, um, it's a branch of literary analysis that looks at the origins of a text, uh, specifically answering questions about who wrote the book, uh, where they wrote it, where they were when they wrote it, the historical context in which it was written. Um, this is independent from uh, what's called lower criticism, which is when uh, this is people who basically, uh, when, you, when archaeologists find fragments, these are the people who piece them back together and who, uh, who figure out, you know, this is part of this document versus this is part of this document. Um, and they, they put them together, they add in uh, edits as far as punctuation and stuff like that. We'll get back to what that is exactly. But lower criticism, uh, there's not a whole lot of people in the world who do that. It's, uh, it's very tedious work, it's a huge pain in the ass. But as far as all of the ancient documents that we have, if it wasn't for lower critics, we wouldn't have those documents to read today and uh, available to us. So it's, it's really important what they do. So let's talk quickly about the purpose and method of history as a social science. Uh, by its nature, uh, the social science of history is not amenable to new key experiment. It is a science, though. It makes testable predictions, and it's falsifiable. That means if we find new evidence uh, that uh, it can help strengthen our, our predictions, um, or it can show that we're wrong. I want to stress, it's not possible to know with certainty what happened in the past. Uh, especially what we're going to be talking about, which is the distant and ill-preserved past. Uh, its history is necessarily founded upon inference and probability. That means it uses all the normal rules of statistics, uh, Bayes' theorem especially, to help you understand um, to what degree uh, evidence leads you toward a conclusion. It's the role of the historian to sort out the most likely chronological record within reason based provisionally on available evidence. Well, I'm going to go through each of the uh, emphasized parts there and talk about those. So the most likely chronological record, what I mean by that is, again, just that we're using probability to figure this out. So you're never 100% certain, and you can change your mind when you find new evidence. Uh, within reason means that we're using logic and we're applying that to probability uh, to see like if something contradicts something else, then, then we would throw it out or, uh, or question it heavily. Uh, based provisionally on available evidence, uh, provisionally, means that we're willing to change our mind if we find something uh, that shows that we're wrong. And available evidence just means we always understand that we could find something new that completely throws uh, under the bus what we thought before. 
Is everybody familiar with the law of parsimony? Do you know what this is? Um, parsimony, I, this is one of the most important concepts in science. Uh, it's also called uh, Occam's razor. Uh, William of Occam formalized it in, in 1327, but it's been around longer than that also. Uh, it, well, parsimony is basically using economy in, in uh, assuming things and your assumptions. You don't want to assume more than you absolutely have to. The simplest explanation is tends to be right. Not that it always is right, but you have to have really good evidence or really good reasons for thinking something is more complicated than it would otherwise look to be. Just as no scientist would ever deny that he could be wrong, neither would any legitimate historian. And anyone who tries to tell you that they're certain that something happened in the past, especially if they weren't there personally, is full of shit. So don't let people tell you that if you're having a discussion about these things. I also want to point out before I move on, even if you were there personally, that doesn't mean that, you're, that you can be certain, that you know that that happened. Uh, it's, it's easy to fool people. Uh, I mean, just, just ask a magician. It doesn't mean that that's what they saw. It just means that they were there. So let's talk a little bit about what we're trying to do today. Um, I, I think in, in any endeavor, you should set out your goals so you know uh, if you've reached them or not. So what we're trying to do is infer to what degree the New Testament authors first were in a position even to offer reliable testimony. Uh, if, uh, if they weren't there personally, or they didn't have good access to people who knew what happened, then it doesn't really matter what they said or what they wrote, because we have no reason to believe that they're right. So that's an important question. If we determine that they were in a position to offer reliable testimony in the first place, then we ask, to what degree did they actually do that? In a lot of cases, people have motivations not to offer a lot of testimony, even if they are in a position to know what really happened. You see this in court all the time. Uh, there can be financial pressures, uh, bribery, or, or the other way, uh, extortion. There can be uh, mob pressures. Uh, somebody might not want to testify against family members or friends, um, or, or stretch the truth or hide things. So. Uh, even if they know what happened, they might not have written what happened for various reasons. So, assuming that they were in a position to know what happened, and they did, in fact, write down the truth, then we have to ask, to what degree did their writing survive to us today, unaltered, uh, as far as the substance of it, and intact as far as do we have the, the whole thing. So, if upon examining these with an open mind, objectively, as unbiased as we can, if we find ourselves with a reasonable doubt, uh, would a reasonable person be doubtful of these things, about any of these three things, then we can't really call the New Testament historically reliable. And uh, as far as, a, uh, well, saying that Christianity is, is a true story. So that's what we're trying to do today. You guys familiar with his YouTube channel? Evidence? Yeah. Evidence is a wonderful YouTube channel. He spells it like that. Look it up sometime. Uh, it's, it's really great stuff. Okay, so let's just quickly go through a little bit of background about what evidence is and why it's important. Not all evidence is created equal. Um, there are certain types of evidence that, as historians, we want, and other types of evidence, as historians, that we would prefer that we not have. Uh, I mean, any, any evidence is better than no evidence but there are certain types that we look for uh, that would more strongly say that this is correct than other types. So one of the things that we look for is contemporary evidence. Uh, we ask, is this at the same time as the events that happened? Ideally, you would have uh, written records from the day of or the day after. This is how newspapers work. Um, if we just find a record from 20 years later, that's a lot less reliable. It tells us a lot less about how much we can trust it really has to say about what really happened um, than something that was, that was the day of or the day after nearby. Do we have uh, lots of sources? Now, if you just have one source saying something, that doesn't mean that it's wrong, but if you have lots of sources saying something, that's a lot better. But more importantly, are those sources independent sources? Uh, do you guys you know how Associated Press works? 
basically, it's a, it's a press agency where they have a, one story that they send out to newspapers. Newspapers can buy these stories and fill space by reporting on um, world issues. Uh, so it's the same exact verbatim wording in all these different newspapers that do this. But you, I mean, you wouldn't say, you know, this story appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Columbia Daily Tribune. I mean, that's not three sources. That's one source. It's just in three different places. So you have to make sure when you're talking about all these different sources that they weren't hopping off of each other. And the, the, uh, the phrase that historians use for this is corroboration without collaboration. That's very, very important. If we have good reason to believe that they were copying off of each other, that they knew each other, uh, that casts a lot of problems, a lot of doubt onto whether we can trust those sources. Are they internally consistent, the sources that we have? If, uh, if a source disagrees within itself about what it's saying, then you have really good reasons to doubt that it's true. Um, for example, in uh, the Gospel of John, in John 2, it says that the first miracle that Jesus did was turning water into wine. Then in John 2, 23, it says that he did many miracles. And then in John 4, 54, he healed a nobleman's son, and the author of John says that it was the second miracle that Jesus did after traveling from Judea to Galilee. So that's, that's inconsistent. Somebody either added that little part or changed something or fudged something, and it tells us how much we can trust that. Is it externally consistent? Do we have archaeological evidence? Uh, or do we have books from other historians who aren't related to that book that disagrees with it? If we have good reason to believe that even if it's internally consistent, uh, that it doesn't make sense with what we know about what happened at that time, then that casts doubt on it as well. Is it unbiased? Do the people who wrote it have some very strong motivation to say something that isn't true? If so, then that casts doubt on what we're talking about. So when we're talking about Jesus as a, as a historical figure, there's something really important to keep in mind. The Gospels and the Pauline Epistles, these are our sources for everything that we know about Jesus' birth, his life, his, what he taught, his death, and his alleged resurrection from the first century. That's what we have. There are no other references to Jesus, period, before about 110 from any other Roman historian, from any Jewish historian that we all have no inscriptions. There is no mention of him whatsoever except for the books that became the New Testament. So that's something important to keep in mind. They did. Yes. What about the uh, Gospels that didn't make it in? I'll get to those. But yeah. so do those not count as early records? Well, Aren't they well okay? not necessarily. Um, some of them are closer to contemporary. Most of the ones that were included were written much later. Um, so, uh, as far as the question here, um, are, these, uh, are these the kinds of sources that historians want, as far as the Gospels and the Pauline Epistles? The answer to that is pretty simple. No, they're not even close to the kinds of sources that historians want. They're better than nothing. I mean, you know, we'll take it and we'll study it. But this is not what we want. What we want is this. And this is, I mean, you know, it's funny, but I mean, I'm serious. Like, you've got, you've got the, the crime scene tape here, which is really important, because you don't want anyone to contaminate your scene and put evidence there that wasn't there originally. You, you're taking pictures of what happened. That's good, a good way to record things that went on. You're interviewing eyewitnesses. That's, I, I mean, I would hope that you're treating people who need medical attention as well. But, um, this is what we want to do, and this is what we do today, and there's a reason that we do it that way. So really quickly, I'm just going to go through the books of the New Testament for those of you who haven't read it or aren't really familiar with how it's put together. So we have four Gospels, uh, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Um, normally the way that the New Testament is published, uh, they're listed in this order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John last. Uh, Mark was chronologically first as far as when it was written, so I tend to say it first. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because uh, it, that just means they agree with each other, basically. John uh, is, is different. It, it's, it tells quite a different story, um, and it's, it's not considered one of the synoptic gospels like the other three. Um, Acts of the Apostles is, uh, is the next bit, um, and that just basically describes uh, 
what, what happened after Jesus died, the rest of the apostles went around doing all sorts of things, healing people and preaching and uh, getting, getting killed themselves, and it talks about this. Um, the uh, 14 Pauline epistles, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Pistola just means letter, so these are just letters that he wrote that became uh, called books later um, that, that Paul wrote. So some of these are uh, named after the recipient of the letter. Um, like Paul wrote a letter to the Romans, to the people who lived on Corinth, um, and so on. So those are called the pastoral epistles. Um, it's related to the word pastor, just basically he's teaching people how they ought to run their church under what he's, what he's saying. Um, and then we have what are called the uh, Catholic epistles. Um, seven of those. Um, these are named after the people who wrote them, or allegedly wrote them. Uh, Catholic just means universal. They're written to a general audience, not to a specific church. So something important here with these stars. One star means that it's what's called undisputed. Pretty much no scholar thinks that it wasn't actually written by Paul. There are seven of those. But we have some others where we're not so sure. Um, the word pseudepigraphic is uh, what scholars use. It's, it's just an academic way of saying it's forged. I mean, today we would just call that a forgery. It's something that was written in the name of Paul that he didn't write, or at least we don't think that he wrote it. Um, so we, the ones with uh, two stars are ones that modern scholars agree with are forgeries, that Paul did not write those. And there are different ways to do that, um, to, to look at uh, as far as analysis. Some of it's pretty complicated as far as um, looking at spellings and, and phrases and stuff like that. And some of it's more obvious, like he just didn't teach the same thing consistently. Um, the ones with three stars, uh, what that means is that scholars are about evenly divided. Uh, the more conservative ones think that he did. Generally, the more liberal ones think that he didn't. But it's about 50-50. And then uh, Hebrews, this last one, um, it doesn't say in it who wrote it. And scholars uh, pretty much universally agree. There are a couple, uh, Craig Blomberg and, and some extremely French conservative guys. But uh, for the most part, every modern scholar agrees that that is absolutely a forgery. There's no way that Paul wrote that. So uh, then I said we have the, the seven Catholic epistles, and then last we have uh, Apocalypse uh, Revelation, that uh, it may have been written by the same author as the man who wrote the Gospel of John. Um, the reason that scholars say that is in it, internally, he refers to himself, the author, as John several times. Uh, so we know the author's name was John, but we don't know that it's the same John as that John. Um, we'll come back to that here in a minute. So that's 27 books total uh, out of the 66 that make up the entire Bible. So let's talk a little bit about... Dave. Yes. Epistle, apostle, tomato, tomato. What's, uh, what's the difference? An apostle is somebody that uh, a religious figure appoints um, to carry on their message after they die. A disciple uh, is somebody that follows somebody else's message. So all Christians are disciples of Christ. Only the first group that Jesus personally appointed are apostles. And if you believe Paul that he really did, that Jesus really did visit him in a vision and appoint him, then Paul is also an apostle. So uh, these these twenty seven books. Uh, an epistle is just a letter. Uh, it's, it comes, I mentioned earlier, from the, the Latin word epistula, and it, it's just, you know, like a letter that you send to somebody. It actually, in Latin, it also means like a letter of the alphabet. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, but it's the same, same root. So, if you had to guess here, how many of these four Gospels do we have wholly preserved from antiquity, which I'm going to call before the year 500, if you have a guess. None of them. None of them. Okay, how many people think it was not? Okay. Uh, a third to half of you? Yeah, uh, you're wrong. It's uh, 16. <laughs> so we have, we have the four canonical Gospels. Uh, canonical just means that they were, they were part of the official canon. Out of the uh, four, we have 16. 
Yes. <laughs> we have some it's a miracle. <laughs> uh, so we have the four canonical gospels. We also have uh, twelve what are called apocryphal. Apocryphal uh, is a it's a Greek word that just means um, its origin is uncertain. Um, so yeah, we have we have several of these. We have uh, Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Truth, the Coptic Gospel of the Egyptians, the Gospel of Nicodemus, uh, and they go on. There's more, but uh, some of them. Uh, we have reconstructed some of them we've completely found. Um, the uh, infancy gospels, um, these, are, these are really great. Um, if you ever are interested in, in doing this and looking this up and reading them, uh, these talk about Jesus as a kid, which is not in the Bible, if you, uh, or in the canon. Um, if you read, uh, Mark doesn't mention Jesus' birth at all. Um, Matthew and Luke have contradicting stories, but they both talk about Jesus' birth. Um, but those two talk about when he was born and the circumstances of that, and then they skip to his ministry when he was 30. So there's really nothing about him as a teenager. These talk about Jesus as a teenager. It's, it's really, really funny stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'm going to cover some of that here a little bit. Um, so as far as... Uh, as aside from these 16 that we have fully put back together, or we found, how many do you think we have either lost, as in we know that they existed because we found other sort of other documents that refer to them by name, but we don't have the document? Fragmentary, that is, archaeologists have found fragments, but not enough to even start to put it back together. Partially preserved, which means we found a substantial portion, but not enough to say that we really have the whole thing. Or reconstructed, where we found enough copies that are partially preserved or fragmentary, where we're able to put the whole thing back together. So, uh, how many do you think we have gospels that is that fit these here? If you just had to guess, the rest, the eleven. Yeah, uh, it's it's more than eleven. Yeah, it's about forty-four. Actually, it's forty-four so far. And, Wait, uh, sixty and forty-four is something like twenty-seven. No, this, this, the 27 is just how many are in the, Bible, in the oh. New Testament. Uh, but this is how many Gospels uh, we have total from antiquity. Four of them made it into the New Testament, but we have many others that didn't, is the point I wanted to make. Is it safe to say there's a lot of, there must have been a lot of fan fiction about it? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's absolutely true. So the reason that we have, and it is true, the reason that we have so many of these, what happened was, uh, the best version of the story that, that we have, and this may not be true, but this makes the most sense, I think, is that after Jesus died, or if you don't believe that Jesus existed, after Paul started spreading the message of Christianity, all these churches that were established uh, had oral tradition that they taught about what Jesus' life was and what his message was and so on. And after a while, they started desiring each church independently started desiring a book to teach from so that they could keep their story straight uh, and so on. Uh, books in the ancient world were extremely expensive. Uh, Richard Carrier estimates in today's dollars about $100,000 per book. So, and the reason is it's complicated. Um, they're made uh, from sheepskin, so you have to raise the animals, which is very expensive. Uh, you don't get very much paper from a sheep, hardly any at all, because it shrinks down and, it's, and you have to stretch it and it's very time consuming. Uh, they had to make their own ink. The ink that they used did not last very long. Um, and then you had to copy it all by hand, which I'll, I'll talk more about here in a little bit. But it just, it, it takes an enormous number of uh, man hours and time and uh, money to do this. Oddly enough, I saw a post on Reddit last night of the exact same methods mm -hmm. that would have been, and it was like one of, I don't know exactly what the book was, but it was that method. Mm -hmm. And they still had the paper in perfect condition. It had been rebound like a dozen or more times. Mm -hmm. But they said it was virtually priceless because yeah. it had lasted so long. Mm -hmm. And they weren't simply ordered, they were commissioned. Yeah, that's usually how it is. Just because it's so expensive that the only people who can afford it are governments or in uh, like libraries and stuff like that. People didn't tend to own these things. Um, so we have 44 of these ancient gospels uh, that basically different churches wrote independently so that they would have one. And uh, then later they all got together and decided which ones they wanted to use when they, when they decided to uh, work together on this stuff. 
but in, uh, originally there were just a bunch of independent churches, and that's why we have so many. Um, in addition to these 44 ancient ones, we also have 25 what are called modern gospels. These are ones from modern times. Uh, the Book of Mormon is an example, but there are many others. And uh, we don't really you know, give these any credence as far as uh, having any authority over what they say. But the people who follow these religions definitely do. Uh, so altogether then, we have 60 uh, ancient gospels with uh, the, the 16 there, the 44 that fit this description, and then the uh, 25 modern gospels. So 85 gospels total, four of which are in the New Testament. <laughs> so, if you ask your pastor, if you're religious, or uh, pretty much anybody that, that teaches this stuff at a church, in a church setting, who wrote the books? If you ask that, this is the answer you'll get. This is what's called the traditional authorship. So, basically, uh, we have, I don't have a laser pointer, I apologize, but we have uh, Joseph and Mary up at the top, Jesus, and then his brothers and sisters. Um, so James, uh, brother of Jesus, wrote the epistle of James. Jude wrote the epistle of Jude. Simon, Peter, just called Peter. His secretary, Mark, wrote Mark. Uh, John wrote the Gospel of John, the epistles, John 1, 2, and 3, and Revelation, and so on. Paul wrote all of these epistles. So this is the story that you'll hear at church. This is pretty much complete bullshit. <laughs> pretty much everything on here is wrong, as far as what scholars have to say about where those books came from. Um, I, I just want to point out one other thing. So Paul had a traveling companion named Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. So uh, something important that, that will be important later, Paul never met Jesus while he was alive. He says so explicitly. Uh, after Jesus died, Jesus appeared to Paul in a vision and, uh, and con Paul converted and went about teaching Christianity. Luke, who traveled with Paul, wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Luke had also never met Jesus. So if somebody tries to tell you that the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses, say no. Luke explicitly was not an eyewitness. In fact, Luke 1.1, 1, 1, he starts telling you his purpose for writing. Uh, the only Gospel that actually says why he's writing this book uh, we don't actually know that they were intending to write a history book, that they were intending for these to be true accounts. I mean, they could have just been oral mythologies that they were recording. We don't know, because they don't say what their purpose is. But Luke does say what his purpose is. I say Luke because we don't know his name, but the, the person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He says in the beginning, I'm writing this to you, uh, Theophilus, which just means a person who loves God, um, in order that you might uh, have an accurate record of what happened when Jesus was alive. And I went around to the church elders to gather my information um, to make sure that everything was accurate. And if you don't believe me, you can go ask them yourself because some of them are still alive. And, and then he goes off into the story. So Luke is the one who actually does tell us where that came from. That's the only one who does that. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the traditional authorship story. This is all wrong. <laughs> so our question from earlier were the New Testament authors in a position to offer reliable primary source testimony? Well, like I was saying, not a single author of any book of the New Testament was an eyewitness to Jesus' birth, life, ministry, trial, or death. Not a single one. If anybody tries to tell you that the New Testament was written by eyewitnesses, it wasn't. It simply wasn't. None of the New Testament authors claims to be an eyewitness. This is really important. It doesn't say in there that I'm an eyewitness and blah, blah. None of these are written in first person. They're all written in third person. None of them are titled. None of them have authors names attached. The names that we have, that we use now, like the Gospel according to John, the Gospel according to Matthew, those were all assigned by committee vote centuries later. They, they put the names on. It's not like it was signed at the bottom. Signed by Matthew. That wasn't there. It was just the story. And then later they said, who wrote this? And then they picked a name and they put it on. Um, so, as far as this question, were they in a position to offer the primary source evidence? Paul and Luke together, and I, I have this uh, as a star here because we know that Paul actually did not write most of his books. Um, but assuming that he did, uh, Paul and Luke together, the authors of 37% of the New Testament, 
explicitly tell us that they're not eyewitnesses. So if somebody tries to say again, it was written by eyewitnesses, say actually in over a third of it, it says that it wasn't, I mean it directly says that it was not written by eyewitnesses, and we have excellent reasons for thinking that the rest of it wasn't either. No. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about higher criticism. Uh, I don't want you to confuse this with exegesis. Exegesis is what theologians do. Um, it's, it's basically explaining, um, or in, interpreting, I think is a better word, the, uh, the semantic content of a text. What did the author mean when they were writing this? Um, higher critics have to do this a little bit just to figure out who wrote it. They have to understand, is this what is, is the content of this consistent with what I know this, this writer has written in other documents that we believe he wrote. So you have to do that a little bit. But not, not the way theologians do it as far as saying, uh, this is what I'm trying to teach based on being accurate to the text. Um, higher criticism, it's also called historical criticism. Um, and the, the major questions that you want to answer as a historical critic are, uh, who wrote it? That's the main one. Who was the actual author? Where was it written? And when was it written? Sometimes there's kind of a blurred line uh, between historical criticism and textual criticism. Because when you're putting together uh, these documents, there are different versions that you have to use. Um, we don't have all of them wholly preserved. We have some of them are fragmentary, some of them are partially preserved. So trying to figure out who really wrote it, uh, if you were working from different copies, uh, in some cases, you're also working as a lower critic, um, trying to figure out which ones are authentic and which ones aren't. And, and that's uh, something else to worry about, too. So, how do these books get their names? And I touched on this already. Uh, the epistles, the letters, are named either after their recipients, in the case of the pastoral ones, or who uh, the, the Catholic Church, the, the traditional authorship says, wrote them. Um, the Gospels are named after their traditional authors. Um, as I mentioned, they're actually all anonymously written and untitled. Um, Parseus Tung, uh, Apostolum, uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, um, chronicles the Apostolic Age, which is after Jesus died until the end of that century. Um, and then uh, uh, Revelation, uh, Apocalypse, uh, describes what happens at the end of the earth when, uh, when judgment happens. And we don't really know if this is supposed to be symbolic or if this is actually supposed to be describing what's really supposed to happen. He doesn't say. Um, we do know that it was written by a guy named John, as I mentioned, uh, and sometimes it's called the Apocalypse of John. Um, and he's sometimes referred to as John of Patmos to distinguish him from the Gospel writer John, because uh, in the very, very beginning of it, he says that he lives on the island of Patmos. So, um, that's where the books got their names. Um, something important, uh, the, the historical apostles, the actual people, were Aramaic speaking, not Greek speaking, which is the language that this was written in, that these books were written in. They were uneducated peasants from Galilee. They were fishermen. Um, when, when they say that, uh, Matthew is a, a tax collector. Uh, that's not what we think of today as tax collector, as far as like an IRS agent, you know, who's educated and, and studied accounting. Uh, that pretty much he was a thug. I mean, he went around house to house and beat people up for not paying their taxes. That's what that meant back then. That's why they were so hated. So these are these are not people who could even write. A very small percentage of, of people in the ancient world were capable of doing this because it was extremely expensive. Uh, the only people who learned how to read and write were people who were rich enough to have their parents afford a tutor to come and teach them. It wasn't like there were public schools back then. So uh, pretty much just uh, senators, kids, and royalty who were really the only ones who learned how to do this. Five to ten percent of the population was thought could read, and an even smaller percentage, uh, a few percent, could write. Uh, reading and writing. Um, were separate skills. Um, learning how to read was something that uh, all educated people got. Yeah. Do you know the dates of when they got their traditional authors? 
Uh, yes, I'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, Just a criminal, wouldn't uh, the synagogues also teach people to read and write? Yes, if you're a rabbi, you did learn how to read. Uh, learning how to write is not quite the same. Um, scribes knew how to write. And being a scribe, uh, is a, it's, it was kind of like in the 50s, knowing how to type. But not everybody learned how to do it. it was, if you were going to be a secretary, then you went to school and learned how to do it. But uh, it wasn't really seen as a high class thing, the way learning how to read was seen as a high class thing. Uh, if you're, if you're in the upper class, you were expected to know how to read. You were not expected to know how to write. In fact, if you knew how to write, uh, it, it might have lowered you a little bit. Because if you, um, they used scribes to do it. They would say, they would dictate to scribes. Scribes would write it down. But if they could read, they would be able to write. Not necessarily. There, I mean, there, there are different skills. And I mean, you, you know what it looks like. But you know, uh, if you can read, you can't necessarily type. They're separate skills, you know. I mean, you have to know how to do it. And don't forget, being a scribe back then was not the same as it is now. You had to know how to make paper, you had to know how to make ink, and you had to know how to make your writing instruments. And those are very, very complicated, time-consuming things um, that you learned how to do if you were a scribe. So, um, uh, in the case of uh, Peter and John, uh, I want to point out um, well, before I get to them, Paul is an exception to what I was saying. Uh, the rest of the apostles, uh, they, they were uneducated people, as opposed to the actual authors of these books, who were highly literate, obviously, uh, Greek-speaking writers, uh, living in a community of Christians. Those are the actual authors of these books, not the people that it says who couldn't read Greek, who couldn't write. Uh, Paul himself... Uh, was a Pharisee, he was very well educated, and uh, he could almost certainly read and may have been able to write. Um, Peter and John, uh, who allegedly wrote uh, three, excuse me, uh, John wrote first, second, and third John, and uh, allegedly the Gospel of John, and allegedly uh, the Apocalypse of John, and then Peter wrote first and second Peter. Um, it explicitly says in the book of Acts 4.13, that they are uh, a grammatoi, which in Greek means uh, illiterate. It, it tells us this. So that's just something that blows my mind that people think this is internally consistent. <laughs> um, so we touched on this a little bit, and, and you were asking this, um, where they got their names, the, the traditional authorship. The short answer to that is by a committee vote centuries later. Uh, all four of the canonical gospels when they were written, were anonymous, and they were unprivate. The author of Revelation, I mentioned earlier, refers to himself several times as John, which is why we also call the Apocalypse of John. But uh, when we're talking about um, where, they, uh, where they got the names, the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to John, the Gospel according to Luke, and so on, that was a committee that voted on this stuff. It wasn't that it said this in the book. So, did they decide on the basis of what? Um, well, a couple of different things. Something, something. Yeah. Um, some of it was, um, like for example, uh, in the story, there are some places where it said Jesus was speaking to a smaller group of his apostles. And so they would say, well, if he's writing this story and he wasn't in this group of three people that this part of it says he was talking to, then we have to exclude the rest of the apostles because it couldn't have been one of them. Um, so that's one way that they did it. Um, but mostly, it was basically just saying, who can we name that would lend credibility to the idea that this is true? And uh, I mean, this is, this is the purpose of forgeries, is that you, you want to use a famous name or a name that's trusted so that people will read it and believe it. There's no point in forging something in the name of a nobody. So if you want other churches uh, to accept your version of the story, and there are many reasons that churches would have wanted that. Um, if you say, well, this version of the book was actually written by Mark, so then we're going to submit this, you know, to be included in the New Testament that everybody's going to use. You have to use our church's one because it came from this guy himself. If it was bullshit, they didn't, but they would make arguments for that. Um, so as far as when this was written. Uh, there's really not one answer to that. It's not like this was written in, in one sitting by one person. 
Um, there's 27 books over a period of time. Paul was the first person to write. Uh, and he wrote his first book, um, scholars uh, place it at 51, is kind of the agreed date for that. Um, we don't have those. The autographs, the, uh, the papers that he actually manually wrote on, um, th those turned dust a long time ago. We have copies of copies of those. But uh, he was the first one. Um, the earliest complete copy of any book, of any single book of the New Testament, comes from the third century. So 200 years after these events took place. The earliest complete copy of the entire New Testament, uh, the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, um, we're not really sure which one of those came first. Most scholars think it was the Vaticanus. Both of these are in the Vatican vaults. Uh, I mean, normal people can't just go and look at them, but if you have a scholarly reason to look at them, they, they have them there, and you can go do that. Um, those date to the fourth century. So we're talking 300 years after these events took place are when uh, we have the first complete copies of these books. Uh, so we have absolutely no idea, uh, no way to verify that they were not substantially changed between when they were written uh, at the end of the first century and when we have this complete copy in the fourth century. Uh, just We have no way of knowing what changes happened in those intervening years. Uh, as far as uh, when the canonical gospels were written, uh, Mark was written first, um, and most scholars put that around the year 70, uh, no, no sooner than 70 because it describes some events that happened in the year 70. Um, and then John was the last one chronologically written. Most scholars put that around 95. Well, some people think it was a little bit later. Um, everybody pretty much agrees that all of the autographs of the entire canonical New Testament were composed by the year 110. So this 27 book <coughs> anthology, yeah? Yeah, that's in Mark, and that's why they place it at 70 or later. Okay. Yeah, that happened in the year 70. Um, and that was, a, that was a big deal for Jews. That, I mean, the, the main temple that Jews came to, um, when that was destroyed, that, that really shook things up. Um, a major event that was written about by many different historians. Um, so as, as far as these 27 books altogether, um, like I said, there are many different churches that all have their own versions, and they were each using their own version. At some point, they all decided, we need to have a consistent message if we're going to all practice the same religion. So they started meeting as, as a committee, as groups. Uh, they sent representatives from each church, which became bishops later, uh, to talk about which versions of these books they're going to use and what messages they want to teach in order to be consistent as a religion. And uh, so this 27-book anthology that they compiled and they later called the New Testament, that may have been compiled as early as the 200s. Uh, we have a, a letter from this, uh, this historian, Morgan, um, in the 200s that mentions this number 27 books. Uh, but he doesn't list what they are. He doesn't say the names of them, so we don't know which 27 he's talking about. Uh, definitely by 367, Athanasius, uh, lists the 27 books. So we know by then which 27 actually made it in. What we don't know is which versions of those 27 made it in, which can make a big difference because we have thousands and thousands of different versions of these. Um, that question of which versions of these is, or excuse me, was um, a, it's a lot of discussion went into that. And that wasn't settled until the Council of Trent in the 16th century. <laughs> um, and, and, there, and actually, I want to point out, this is still disputed today. The Eastern Orthodox Church in Europe uses a different version of the Bible than we do. Than, and the Catholic Church also uses a different version than the Protestant churches. Um, because they couldn't agree on which books go in and which books couldn't. Um, or didn't, excuse me. Uh, and then, in addition to that, there's the Apocrypha, which the Catholic Church publishes with their Bibles, uh, the books that uh, are of questionable origin, but they still think are important um, for, for some historical reason, and, and they include it. So this is, to answer your question, how the New Testament came to be these 27 books specifically. This is an artist rendering from 40 years later. Um, so uh, 
yeah, it was, these are bishops, these are representatives from all the different churches that they sent to say this is what our church teaches and what we believe, and they argued, they presented their case for why um, what they were teaching was the right one, the right version of the story, and uh, why the book that they're using is the one that ought to be included in the official one, and they voted and they picked them. John, the Gospel of John, made it in by one vote into the New Testament. Uh, it, the reason is because it disagrees so much with what the other Gospels say, the other three. Um, it's, it's very, very different than what it teaches. It's the only Gospel that says that Jesus was divine, first of all. Uh, it's the only one that talks about substitutionary atonement, which is the idea that Jesus died for your sins so that you can go to heaven instead of hell, uh, which is a pretty basic teaching of Christianity. Um, the reason that um, if you listen to street preachers, they'll always tell you to go read such and such in the Gospel of John, and it's much more common um, people who pass out Bibles and stuff, they'll pass out John if they're not passing out the whole thing. And the reason is that that teaches all of that stuff. It's not in the rest of it. Um, Mark, for example, doesn't teach about the resurrection. It doesn't say that Jesus was resurrected in Mark. It's not in there. Uh, the last 12 verses of Mark uh, do say that he resurrected, but everybody agrees, every scholar agrees that those are forged and added later. The original version of Mark does not say that. The original version of Mark, uh, actually no version of Mark, says that there was a virgin birth. It, I mean, these are not part of the story. Those were added later as the oral myths grew around this guy after he died. So, I definitely don't have time to go through this, and I don't have my laser pointer either. But this is where the New Testament actually came from. It's much, much more complicated than the uh, traditional authorship. Uh, each of these different colors here are a different geographical area where these books came from, Galilee, Syria, Asia Minor, Greece, and Rome there at the top. Um, there's, uh, there's some competing hypotheses. Uh, Quill, or the, the Q document, we don't have. Um, but it's, a, uh, it's a, high, uh, a theorized document that we hope to find someday. Um, there's also the, what's called the two-source uh, theory about where these books came from. It's, it's complicated, but um, this, is, this is what it actually looks like. This is what scholars have put together to say this is where they came from. Uh, NC means not canonical. So our question, did the source documents uh, of the New Testament authors survive to the present day, unaltered and intact, even if what they were writing was accurate. Uh, if they didn't make it to us now, then it doesn't really matter. So, really quickly, I'm just going to bust through textual criticism and lower criticism. So, as far as how many biblical autographs survive, uh, as I mentioned before, an autograph is the actual piece of paper uh, or, or parchment that the author wrote on. And uh, I've mentioned this already, none of them, absolutely none of them. All we have are, actually, all we have are copies of copies. Um, sheepskin does not last very long. Ink lasts even less time. Uh, and it wasn't uncommon for them to write over the ink uh, with new ink to keep it going. But parchment itself, um, it's, it's organic. It just doesn't last. You have to use a new piece regularly uh, if you want to keep your book around. Uh, I mean, they didn't have Xerox machines. That's just not how they did it for thousands of years. Um, the oldest fragment of any part of the New Testament. Uh, it's from uh, the John Ryland's library. Uh, it's called Papyrus P52. Um, it's from the Gospel of John, which remember is the latest of the four Gospels, canonical Gospels that was written. It has two verses, John 18, 31 through 33 on the front side, and John 37 through 39 on the back. It's three and a half inches by two and a half inches. It's about the size of a credit card. That's the oldest part of the entire 27 book New Testament that we have. That's it, right there. <laughs> it's not much to work with. Uh, and it dates to uh, about, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is what it looks like. That's the rector, and that's the where so. Um, so that's it, that's the New Testament. About 30 characters you read on each one. So, um, yeah, not, not much there to play with. Um, we have copies from later, and we have more fragments from data, dated later. But this is the earliest that we have to work with, not, not much. Uh, as far as when this was written, uh, it's in Hadrianic style, uh, so that dates it to Emperor Hadrian's reign, which uh, was 117 to 138. Um, paleographic evidence, uh, looking at the, the carbon content uh, of the 
because it, it was parchment made from sheepskin, um, dates it between 100 and 150. Most scholars agree to just split it in the middle, uh, split the difference and say about 125 is, is when we say this was written. So 125, Jesus died in 33. That's 100 years after Jesus died is when this was written. This is definitely a copy. Uh, John, John was not alive 130 years. Um, so yeah, we, we don't actually have an autograph from any of them. Um, so the oldest complete New Testament, uh, all 27 books, uh, as I mentioned before, fourth century, uh, 300 years after Jesus died. And the most important thing about that is that by then we have all of these different partially preserved ones um, before we, we started finding whole ones. And in those, there are variations. Yeah? How do we, how do we know it's a copy again? A couple of different ways. If this were actually written uh, by uh, John, he would have had to be 130 years old when he wrote it. How, how do we know John was born like in the year zero? Presuming that he was about the same age as Jesus. Okay. Uh, and uh, I mean, even if he was 10 years old when Jesus died, which seems unlikely considering what we have to say about him, he would still be 110 years old. So it just seems unlikely. Um, and uh, also, um, we have references to the book, the Gospel of John. We don't have fragments from that time, but we have references to it uh, from the year 95. So it existed already. Uh, and also, where this was found geographically does not make sense if it was, it, it, it had already spread by then. Um, so as far as the variations uh, in these different copies, um, this is important stuff because people, I mean, there are people who try to take the Bible literally, and you can't, I and mean, you can't take it literally because there are variations in the text. So it just depends on which versions you're working with uh, and how you're translating it. It's, it's not possible to take it literally. Um, there are uh, 400,000 variations in the different versions of these books that we have. That's more than double the number of words in the New Testament altogether, which is about 181,000 words. So, I, I mean, just a ridiculous number of variations. Most of those, to be fair, are not that important. Their uh, spelling wasn't standardized back then. They didn't like publish an official dictionary or something. So some uh, scriptorums used a certain spelling. It's, it's kind of like H-O-N-O-R versus H-O-N-O-U-R. It just depended on where you lived. Um, and the empire was pretty big, so there were regional variations. Um, and some of it was uh, just misspellings. It's obvious we knew what they meant. It's not actually like an error, but, uh, but those are variations. But some of them are more substantial, where it actually teaches something different. So then we have to decide which ones we want to go with. Um, we have uh, 24,300 copies of the New Testament from ancient times. Um, so that's just a, a lot of room for variations. So let's look at some types of textual errors um, that happen when you have scribes copying this stuff by hand. There are 10 types of what are called uh, involuntary copying errors. Uh, and I want to point out every single scribe does this, many of these. Um, th there are just, there are no scribes that were capable. These people, I mean, they worked in, in monasteries, in, in cells. Um, by candlelight, often in very long shifts, uh, just copying by hand from uh, the uh, exemplar, which is the, the one you're copying from, and onto your new one. Um, for you know, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, you're going to make mistakes. It just happens. So let's look at some of those different types. Uh, hypography, this is where uh, you accidentally put in um, one letter, when in the original exemplar there were two letters in that word. Uh, but it's a real word. so. It passes. Um, those often, we know what happened. We can tell by the context what it was supposed to be, but not always. Dittography is the opposite. Uh, when you accidentally put in two letters, when the original there was only one letter. Metathesis is when you transpose two letters, um, but it's, it makes a real word, so your brain doesn't register that it's wrong. Um, an, an example that I read about this, which I thought was pretty humorous, um, the, the sentence, the uh, the bathroom door was magnificent. <laughs> it's something quite different. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, fusion <coughs> is when you combine two words that were not originally uh, one word. Uh, 
Fission is the opposite, where you split two words that were uh, originally one. Uh, homophony, um, if you had two scribes working as a pair and you had one dictating the other one writing down, uh, and you had a homophone, then that could happen. Uh, substitution is where you just simply misread it and you write the wrong letter and it ends up being a real word. Um, so, uh, you guys familiar with how Pac-Man the game got its name? You know the story. So, when you uh, transliterate the name of the game uh, from Japanese to English, you get Puck-Man, that's what it's called. But, uh, what happened was in uh, Japanese arcades, um, excuse me, American arcades that had this game, teenagers being teenagers, uh, vandalized things and would take a knife and scratch out this little part of the people. <laughs> so it said, fuck man. <laughs> and so, pretty quickly, uh, there were requests to change the name, and they changed it to Pac-Man instead. So, yeah, it's just kind of fun. Uh, Homo will tell you is when you omit an entire passage because two adjacent paragraphs have the same ending. Now, this is pretty common um, because of the way the Bible is written. In the Bible, uh, and it's the same in the Odyssey and the Iliad, it's, it's um, a, a technique for making things sound poetic. You repeat phrases. So you might have a paragraph where the last sentence um, would say something like, uh, and so it was, or whatever. And then the next paragraph, the last sentence of that paragraph is also, and so it was. And so say you're copying this along, and you look at your exemplar, and you finish that first paragraph, and you come over here and you copy it down. And then you look back and you see the, the second, the last sentence of the paragraph that says, and so it was, and so you skip to the next one and you start there. Mm -hmm. But if, there was, if you accidentally glanced at the second one instead of the first one, then you just skipped that entire paragraph when you were copying. That happened pretty regularly. So yeah, there are, there are entire passages missing uh, when that happened. Accidentally just omitting words. Um, if there's a grammatical way to write something and you try to remember too big of a chunk when you're looking at it and when you're copying it down, uh, especially you know, if you're impatient, um, that can happen. Uh, memory errors, uh, this also happened pretty regularly as far as we can tell. Uh, I mean, if you do this eight or 10 hours a day for your entire career, you're gonna start to memorize the whole thing. And uh, many of the books are substantially similar. 90% uh, of Mark appears verbatim in Matthew and um, Luke is a little different, but a lot of it appears in Luke, about 60% of it in Luke. And, uh, I mean, they're pretty much the same document. Matthew is just longer and it has more detail. Um, so if you're if you're writing and if you're copying Matthew and uh, you, you're just you're speeding it up by writing from memory and you remember something from Mark, um, you can screw up a sentence that way. So there are also four types of what are called uh, voluntary errors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> Bias. This one uh, is pretty important. So, say you're a scribe, and you have multiple exemplars to choose from as far as which version you're going to use. Now, normally, uh, a scriptorium would choose which versions they're going to have you copy. But uh, even at the supervisor level, they had different versions to choose from. So. They might, um, for doctrinal reasons or just personal preference, have chosen a version that fits with your own view more than uh, what's original to, to the author. Um, say, uh, for example, say you were gay and there was a version that was much harsher toward homosexuality. You might not choose that version because you know, don't want to perpetuate that. So that can happen. Um, clarification. This is where uh, you just add a lot of explanation to a sentence to make it more clear what you're actually trying to say. You just keep going and going until it's very, very clear and there's no question of exactly what you meant, like I'm doing right now. Um, that's, that's clarification. Uh, so grammar and spelling. Uh, Latin, or excuse me, or, or Koine Greek is the language that these are originally written in. As the, uh, the Greek speakers merged with the Roman speakers, um, and especially uh, when Jerome was commissioned to write uh, a Latin version, the uh, Vulgate Bible, um, they started writing Latin instead of Greek, doing these copies. And over time, Latin became Italian. Um, so when this happened, you had versions at all of these intermediate stages 
where the grammar was shifting and the spelling was shifting as one language became another language. So you might have a, a spelling that's archaic or a way of phrasing something that's archaic, and the scribe was like, this is, it just sounds weird to write it this way. So they, up, they did the document of favor and updated it, and uh, that makes it less true to the original. Um, so, marginal notes. These are less common. They're also something that critics love to find. These are very, very helpful for us as far as understanding these types of mistakes and what the originals may have said. So if you have two versions of a document and the scribe wasn't sure which reading was the correct one, either because um, their, their uh, scriptorum had a disagreement about it, their church did, um, or you just had multiple versions and you weren't sure which one you were supposed to use, uh, sometimes they would note this in the market. And uh, I mean, we love when this happens. This is really wonderful. Um, because it tells us a lot about what it may have said, what the other version may have said if we don't have the other version. So, this is a very famous example. This is from the Codex Vaticanus Gregus, uh, 1209, which is in the Vatican vaults. Um, this is the end of uh, Second uh, Thessalonians and Hebrews. starts right there. And uh, so, we have this uh, margin note right there. And it says, uh, which in Greek means uh, <coughs> stupid servant boy, keep the old wording and don't change it. <laughs> so, <laughs> something right here. Uh, he wasn't supposed to change it, he did. And we don't know what he was copying from. We don't have that exemplar. So all we know is that this is wrong. Um, but that tells us a lot about, about the authenticity of this passage. Um, uh, if you're curious, um, the uh, margin note is next to Hebrews 1.3, which says, uh, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So something about that is wrong. It is. Yeah. And I know it doesn't apply to the bottom of the middle column. We don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have it with me. <laughs> you left it at the Vatican? Yes. <laughs> so, how do textual critics do what they do as far as reconstructing these autographs, uh, these manuscripts? Sorry about that. Um, there's a couple different ways. Um, one of the things that we look for is uh, external evidence. We can date a document um, based on what it's made of. Uh, if it's made of papyrus, then it's older than if it's made of parchment because the technique wasn't developed yet. Uh, if it's paper, then we know it's much sooner than that, much uh, closer to the present because paper, except unless you lived in China, um, was much newer than that. Uh, even the type of papyrus may be different. So originally, they were using papyrus from Egypt. Um, there was a subspecies there that was very good for this purpose, it, but uh, it went extinct because they used it too much. And then they started using a, a subspecies from Sicily instead. And so we can tell by figuring out, uh, by doing testing on this, which subspecies it was, and figure out more accurately when something was written. Later they started to use parchment instead because it lasted longer, uh, and after that paper because it was cheaper. Um, if we're using parchment um, or papyrus, we can date it by looking at the carbon-14 content um, and some other Methods similar to that. What's Another way. Which... What's parchment made of? Is that a sheep skin? Oh, that's okay. Not, I didn't know the original ones, but usually. Mm -hmm. well, we still have some things from Egyptian papyrus, right? Mm -hmm. So how did they get the Egypt, Egypt is much drier. That's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is also, if anybody's curious, why Middle Eastern religions still have ancient books. <laughs> and books from other parts of the world did not survive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, the reason we have mummies in the Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this dry? Yeah, stuff lasts longer in dry climates. Mm -hmm. So another way uh, to date something is uh, just where it was found. If we find a document in northern England, uh, we, we know <laughs> a, a Christian document. Uh, we know that it must have come later because we have records of, of Romans spreading and where their influence went. And we know that they weren't present in England at that time. Uh, and so that tells us it came from later on. Uh, I guess it was, yeah, it was Hadrian who 
who brought the Roman Empire up to, uh, to England. You guys know about Hadrian's Wall in Ireland? This is great. So uh, basically, they were expanding the empire at an enormous rate, and uh, Hadrian had a, a propensity to do this uh, aggressively. And when his army got to uh, Ireland, um, Scotland, thank you, <laughs> big difference, got to Scotland, um, they came across these uh, fire-haired uh, warriors who were just terribly vicious and who were killing a lot of their people. And so instead of trying to take them over like they had done with every other place that they went, they just built a huge fucking wall. It's called the Wall, it's still there. But um, yeah, they're just like, we don't want any part of that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so uh, internal evidence uh, is also useful for telling us um, the age of the document. Uh, Lectio Brevior uh, is a Latin phrase that means the shorter reading. And uh, the shorter reading, it, it tells us that a document is older. Because if something uh, is clarified over time, you tend to add more to it rather than take away from it. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Blaise Pascal and Pensies wrote uh, a wonderful little quip where he says in this very long letter, um, I apologize for the length of this letter. I didn't have time to make it shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but, yeah, um, things tend to get longer the more you mess with them, and that's why uh, newer readings tend to be longer. So shorter ones we can look at and say it's probably older. Not necessarily, but probably. Uh, Lectio Deficular um, means that the harder reading is probably older. If there's something that uh, doesn't make sense, if it's vague, if it's ambiguous, it's probably older because people tend to clarify over time. Um, so that's another way to look at it. So just as an example here, um, can anybody read this? I, I mean, you're not going to be able to, but... Um, Only because I have So, in Latin, there's no punctuation, there's no minuscule letters, no lowercase letters. Uh, there are no spaces. So, I mean, you think walls of text, like on blogs, are bad? Like, this is all of Latin for a long time. Um, this is what it looked like um. until vulgar Latin when they started adding the punctuation and spaces. So, this is what you're, you're dealing with. Um, and there were no W's, so they just used two Ds. Uh, actually, there were no U's either. But, um, yeah, so this might be what you're dealing with. So, what a textual critic does is take something like this and turn it into something that we can use. So you start with chopping away the letters that don't belong in this sentence, which you have to be able to tell what's the previous sentence, what's the current sentence, what's the next sentence to do that. So then you're left with this. And this is starting to become legible. We, I mean, we can make sense of this, even if it doesn't really have, have a semantic meaning yet. Um, so then they put in spaces, they put in punctuation, they put in uh, capital letters, or lowercase letters in this case. And we can actually have an English sentence. This has meaning, this has structure, we know what this says. So this is what a textual critic does. Now, there's more than one way to do this. Uh, you could also do it this way, which means something entirely different <laughs> from this way. Um, but it depends on the critic. And there's no way to know which one is the author intended, um, unless by the context you can guess. But it's a guess. A lot of this is done this way. So, we had a question, uh, what was in the books that were not voted in? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that is in there. Jake and Christ, Jesus Christ, Dragon Master. <laughs> so, this, is, this is from the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew. Now, Pseudo-Matthew, um, this was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and we have the whole thing. And it reads, And lo, suddenly there came forth from the cave many dragons, and when the children saw them, they cried out in great terror. Then Jesus went down from the bosom of his mother, and stood on his feet before the dragons, and they adored Jesus, and thereafter retired. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is Jesus as a child. Jesus as a child. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the apocryphal ones. Uh, so he didn't even fight him. He just like, stared him down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sterling. <laughs> I swear I've seen like that reinterpreted in like 
Sunday school as like a great wizard or something? Well, this actually isn't in the Bible. This is in Pseudo Matthew, which is an extended version of Matthew that was not in. Um, so, what else didn't make it in? Jesus takes pools of water very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an infancy gospel of Thomas, which is uh, mostly reconstructed, uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 2 to 3. Um, now what's going on in this scene? Jesus, uh, as, a, as a younger child, is uh, playing with a pool of water, with a stick. He's poking at this, at this uh, pool of water. And in the story, he causes the water to rise up and become alive into these little figurines that start dancing with each other. And another child comes up to him and sees this, and you'd think he'd be like freaked kind of the fuck out, right? But what he does is he kicks the water in Jesus' face, which is a really stupid thing to do when you're talking to the king of the universe. <laughs> o evil and godly and foolish one, what hurt do the pools and the waters do thee? Behold, now also thou shalt be withered like a tree, and thou shalt not bear leaves, neither root nor fruit. And straight away, the lad withered up holy. He killed the kid. He killed the kid for kicking water in his face. <laughs> Jesus up and wastes some kids. So this is the next part. Jesus was provoked and said unto him, Thou shalt not finish thy course. And immediately he fell down and died. <laughs> Jesus is a real nice guy. Well, he... You probably brought him back. I'm sure you're just omitting the next sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <actually. laughs> so, and just to wrap that up, then, who wrote the New Testament? For seven of the 13 Pauline epistles, except for those seven, we don't know. We don't know who wrote any of the rest of it. We know that the guy who wrote uh, the Apocalypse of John is named John. It was a common enough name that doesn't really tell us a lot. But that's it. That's all we know. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, uh, who later changed his name to Paul when he converted, um, he wrote the Undisputed Epistles. He's the earliest New Testament author. Um, but he and his secretary, Luke, uh, traveling companion, rather, um, both explicitly say that they never met Jesus uh, in the flesh when he was alive, as a real person. Um, everything that we have from Paul, which is all of it that's not disputed um, is entirely hearsay. It's entirely secondhand. So if anybody tries to tell you that they're following this because it's directed from Jesus, or they're following this because it's from eyewitnesses to his life, that's bullshit. The only stuff that we have that's authentic is from someone who says he never met Jesus. So all New Testament, not, that's not not all, but uh, nearly all. New Testament scholars, including Christian ones, agree that none of the four canonical Gospels were actually written by their traditional authors. The only place you will hear that traditional authorship story is from pastors who don't want to tell you the real story because it has uh, a tendency to affect people's faith. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now, these people know this. If you went to seminary, you are required to take classes on historical Jesus and modern scholarship. They know this information. They just lie about it. They don't tell people that it's not really written by these people because they're full of shit, because their incomes depend on it. Uh, it's, it's really unethical. Uh, I have a question, but yeah. that, uh, doesn't that affect their faith? I mean, why Some of them, yeah. The dropout rate at seminary is very, very high. A lot of people go to seminary because uh, they grew up you know, being homeschooled or whatever and, and uh, going to conservative Christian private schools and they decide, you know, I've got this fire from the Holy Spirit, I want to be a preacher, and they go to seminary and take their first history class, and they're like, whoa, I'm completely wrong about all of this. And then they change their mind and they go to the right So why, that begs the question, why do they keep continuing on teaching it this way? When it, that's why. They're committed. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's so an industry. For every one person who quits, there's going to be another one who's going to stay. So. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. And I think there are two seminaries, at least, where they, they you know, will kind of give this a... A brief mention, but sort of say, but you know, yeah. stuff like Moody's, yeah, and, uh, Viola, and, I think. yeah, and yeah, there are, there are several that um, that pay lip service to yeah. the to historical scholarship. This is well established. Uh, for two hundred years, everything that I just told you has been totally mainstream scholarship. You know, this is what we've understood about this. There's plenty of evidence for it. It's not questioned by scholarship. Um, 
we found additional documents. Finding the Dead Sea Scrolls was huge. Um, there, have, there have been some other things that we found that have reinforced it, but uh, th this is not this is not disputed among scholars. Yeah. Can you say a few words what the Dead Sea Scrolls are? When the, they yeah. So um, basically, the Dead Sea Scrolls were a collection of documents that were hidden for a very very long time, in the 1950s, uh, by accident. Uh, some uh, sheep herds looking for their sheep found them in a, in a clay uh, jar. They, uh, if I remember the story right, they like threw a rock into this cave and they heard a, a clay pot like break. And they're like, well, something is in there. So they went in and checked it out and they found these that had been hidden thousands of years. Uh, it had complete copies of uh, the Torah and um, some stuff from the New Testament and some stuff that wasn't included in the New Testament, including the Gospel of Pseudo Matthew, which we have a whole copy of now. Uh, it's, it's been very helpful to scholarship. Um, yeah, but I mean, there are other things that we found, fragments and stuff, that also reinforce this type of stuff. Um, that just make it clear that it, it wasn't written by these people. So, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, none of the canonical Gospels, the four Gospels, were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Whoever wrote uh, the Gospel we call the Gospel according to Luke uh, may have also written Acts. People are kind of split on this. Um, there's some extremely recent scholarship that says, that, that makes some scholars lean more toward that it was the same person, but we're not really certain about that. Uh, it doesn't tell us who he was, it just tells us that it was the same person. Um, we do know that the author of Revelation, uh, his name was John, uh, he says that a few times, uh, that he lived on an island called Patmos. Um, but uh, scholars pretty much agree, except for the extremely conservative fringe ones, uh, that this is not the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John. Um, there are just uh, things like uh, the way that he phrases things, or the way that he spells things, uh, some of the basic the teachings as far as the theology, they just, they, they don't match. And a, a person does not change um, from one book to the next book, you know, how, how they phrase certain idioms and how they spell. It's just, it's obviously not the same person. Um, the joining community, um, that is uh, the, the community of people who follow John, who, who became Christians and started practicing Christianity, uh, that community produced first, second, and third John. Uh, later, it was not the, the actual person, John. Um, and that's very well established that that community produced it. So, our last question, uh, did the New Testament authors, in fact, offer historically reliable, historically accurate testimony? Your answer to that is no. Uh, in fact, they contradict each other uh, and extra-biblical history uh, on some pretty major points. Um, for example, uh, on what day was Jesus crucified? John says it was the day of the preparation for Passover, uh, which is the day before Passover. Passover begins at sundown, so it was that day. Uh, the Synoptic Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say it was uh, the next morning, the, the, during the day, the day of Passover. So this is a pretty important difference. Um, this is the most important holiday of the year. There is no way that the actual people involved in the situation would mix things up. This would be like somebody accidentally forgetting that uh, their parents, like, you know, I mean, this is the leader of your religion, were killed in a car accident, and this is like you saying, I remember it because it happened on, you know, New Year's Eve, versus saying, I remember it because it happened on January 1st. It's like, you would remember. It's, it's a big difference. So the question would be, well, why, why is this different? And I think you miss something by trying to gloss over this and say, well, it was a mistake, or you know, trying to, to reconcile them by saying it mattered uh, based on you know how you're counting the hours or something like that. There's a good explanation for why these are different, and if you look at it theologically, it makes a lot of sense. John, remember, is the only one to say that Jesus is the Lamb of God; that he, by dying, replaced everybody's need to uh, sacrifice animals uh, with the substitutionary atonement thing so that everybody could go to heaven and, instead of hell. So normally what happens on the day of the preparation of Passover is Jewish people go to the temple, uh, they exchange their money for temple money, they buy a uh, sacrificial animal, they give it to the priest, the priest slaughter it, they burn the best part for God 
to inhale the wonderful scent, and then they eat the rest of it. And, uh, and that becomes the Passover dinner. So by putting Jesus' crucifixion uh, on the day of preparation, what John was saying, theologically, is that Jesus was sacrificed on the day of preparation. He calls him the Lamb so that this religion could take off. I mean, it's, it's an important theological difference there. Um, another uh, contradiction here, uh, what year was Jesus born? Uh, Matthew says explicitly it was when Herod was the Roman high king in Judea. Uh, Herod was the Clement high king of Judea from 37 BCE to 4 BCE. Uh, Luke says explicitly it was while Herodes was the governor of Syria, and he was the governor from 6 to 12 CE. Those definitely cannot both be the same. There's a 10-year gap between them. The client king system was um, abolished and replaced with the governor system uh, in the intervening years. We, we know that this is not both true. It's just simply one of those is wrong or both of them are wrong. And it's a pretty big gap. Um, so it's, it's impossible to reconcile. Um, another difference. Uh, was Jesus born in Mary and Joseph's house in Bethlehem, which is what Matthew says, or did they travel 80 miles from their home in Nazareth on foot while Mary was nine months pregnant <laughs> and placed baby Jesus in a livestock feed trough because the inn was full, which is what Luke says. Uh, I mean, there are hundreds of these differences. Um, these are just a couple of them. Uh, when Jesus died, was there an earthquake strong enough to break bones? Actually, two of them. Uh, a supernatural darkness covering the sky, spontaneous tearing of the curtain of the Holy of Holies, and a mass resurrection of Jewish holy men crawling out of their graves and appearing to many people in Jerusalem. That's what John says happened when Jesus died on the cross. Uh, none of the other gospel authors mention that. You think that they would mention that? If, you know, something like that happened. You think some, you know, historians, Roman historians living in Jerusalem, maybe would have mentioned that? It seems kind of like a big deal. Um, the, the Holy of Holies, by the way. Um, this is literally, to uh, Jews, the most sacred place on earth. It's like Mecca for Jews. Um, basically, the way this works is uh, when uh, Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, um, and later it was all compiled into the Torah, they had this copy of the Torah, in a, they built a temple and they stored it there, there was a curtain in front of it, um, the Holy of Holies is the room where that is stored. Uh, only the high priest is allowed to go in there, and only one day a year, uh, and it's on Yom Kippur, and it's to ask for forgiveness for his sins, and then after that he asks for forgiveness of the sins of anybody else. Um, it is, it's extremely, extremely sacred to Jews. If that curtain tore supernaturally, you can bet Jewish historians would have mentioned that. That would be extremely important to them. That would be like they're an earthquake destroying Mecca. I mean, Muslims would have said something about this in their history books. We don't have any record of that. Um, this is probably not true. <laughs> As I mentioned, there are hundreds and hundreds of these. I mean, literally hundreds of things that cannot both be true because different books say things that are irreconcilable. Those are just three that I, I picked because I thought they were funny. Um, so returning to our, well, we're supposed to come up one at a time. Um, <laughs> returning to our three questions here. Were the New Testament authors in a position to offer reliable primary source testimony in the first place? No, they weren't. They weren't eyewitnesses. They didn't even speak the same language. They were living uh, at least one generation later in a different geographical area. They weren't at all related to those people. Uh, did they, in fact, offer a historical reliable account? Not even close. It totally contradicts everything else that we have from history at the time. Uh, it doesn't even make sense internally in a lot of, of cases. Um, there's just tons and tons of problems. Uh, did their testimony survive to the present day substantially unaltered and intact? Not even close there either. We have uh, many uh, instances of things being changed, uh, not just um, minor things, but substantially changed. Uh, at best, all we can really say about it is it's historically inconclusive. Uh, I, I would go further than to say that it's historically inaccurate and wrong, but uh, if somebody tries to say that it's that it's reliable, uh, I, I would say that they are ignorant. <laughs> so, to wrap this up here, the New Testament, um, 
it, it honestly does have some things that are worth studying. That's why I study it. Um, the, these messages, and these are not unique to Christianity by far. They're much older than Christianity. But this idea that you should love everyone, um, if somebody harms you, that you should offer your other cheek to them to harm that one too. Um, be charitable, be honest. These, these are basic truths of, of living in a cooperative species. Uh, there's some, some interesting poetry, especially the, uh, uh, what are they called, parables. Um, and you know the story itself is it's entertaining. It's it's mythology, and just like Greek mythology or any other mythology that we would study, and it tells us a lot about the ancient Middle East as far as what these people thought and they practiced and um, and what was important to them as a culture, not as as actual history, but just culturally important to them. But uh, just like the Quran or the Upanishads or whatever other religious texts we're talking about, it's not a true story. It's not a, it's not a history book. Um, so if you're going to read it, which I recommend, read it for its literary value, which is the way it's supposed to be read. Um, and don't take it too seriously. And that's all I have. Thank you. So uh, we ran over by quite a bit, but I'm totally, <laughs> uh, totally willing to answer questions. Um, or if you just want to go to dinner now and talk about it, then that's fine. Yeah, Michelle. I just wanted to make like a quick comment to, uh, especially like Mizzou students. If you have a chance, you should go to Ellis Library and check out the rare books collection because it's a lot of what he's talking about. So you can actually see like the parchment and the binding and stuff like mm -hmm. that. It's so cool. Yeah, at, uh, at American Atheist headquarters in New Jersey, we actually have a rare books library that's part of our building. CFI um, does as well. Yeah, yeah CFI is bigger. Than <laughs> right. yeah, ours, is, ours is pretty cool too. The Vatican is going to be digitizing their entire. Yes, collection. I know, and I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've digitized quite a bit of it already. Just you know, the, the more important ones. The Vatican is online, um, and uh, that's probably the most important. I'm just going to use the oldest copy that we have. Um, Sinaiticus uh, has been mostly digitized, um, and it's also historically very important. There are many others uh, that we'll get. You know, you, you can buy that in the bookstore, but. Um, the, the autograph from Jerome. Um, they're going to be digitizing. Yeah, it should be cool stuff. Uh, yeah. Are there any books you would recommend on this topic? Sure. Um, Richard Carrier has some. Uh, Not the Impossible Faith is, is a good one. Um, uh, Jesus Interrupted, misquoting Jesus, um, forged by uh, those three are by Bart Ehrman. Um, a History of God by Karen Armstrong. Um, let's see. I can, you know what? I'm just going to put together a list. And I'll, <laughs> I'll post it on Facebook. Okay. And then Sasha's going to raise yeah. a bunch of money me, and start a library. <laughs> <laughs> Let me run something by you that I've encountered from time to time, mm -hmm. uh, but I've never like looked into seriously. So, mm -hmm. as a sort of quippy retort to arguments along these lines, mm -hmm. that you just made. Uh, someone might say, we have just as much reason to believe, you know, Jesus existed as we do to believe Socrates existed. So, you know, like, Plato is the one who wrote things. Yeah. Um, not, like I said, I haven't looked into it, but do you know anything about the actual uh, historical critical method applied to Plato's dialogues? Yeah, so we have far, far fewer copies of Plato's dialogues than we do of any of this stuff. Um, and they're farther removed chronologically from when he was writing than from when these were written. Um, so, it, technically, yes, we should trust the accuracy, the word-for-word -word accuracy of those documents less than we trust the word-for-word -word accuracy of these. But there are two reasons that that makes less of a difference uh, in our study of it. Um, Greek, uh, classical Greek, not Koine Greek. Koine means common or like vulgar uh, in, in uh, the language. Uh, Koine Greek is a simplified version of Greek um, versus classical Greek, which is very poetic, um, and the meter matters quite a bit. So it, it's difficult to explain, but it's very, when I say poetic, it's, it doesn't rhyme, but it's kind of like that. Uh, the, the meter changes from line to line. There are patterns that you use, and if somebody had edited something, we wouldn't know because the meter would be off unless they were very, very skillful at substituting a word for another word that has the same meter with the same stresses on the same syllables that fits the context and has, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it's very difficult to 
to make those kinds of edits to classical Greek the way it is to Koine Greek or to Latin. The other reason it doesn't matter is that nobody bases a religion on the word-for-word -word accuracy of what they wrote, <laughs> whereas people do on this. So if somebody says, you know, well, we don't believe that that is true, it's like, it doesn't matter if it is. It's still good philosophy and it's worth studying. If somebody was trying to argue that we should make public policy around that, then it would matter if, you know, if we're doing that. But nobody is claiming that this was divinely real and that it matters exactly the wording where they are with this. Yeah. So you were talking about how none of the books were actually written in the time of Jesus mm -hmm. and how the pastor just noticed. Um, is it actually found in the Bibles that like, we have today or is it kind of excluded and you can't actually find it? Uh, it depends on the Bible. There are study Bibles um, that will have half the page uh, the verses and the second half of the page is all the footnotes mm -hmm. that will explain this stuff. Um, and uh, most Bibles are pretty good about the last 12 lines of the 12 lines of Mark, uh, which say that that's the part that says Jesus was resurrected. Um, most Bibles are pretty good about making a notation that that was not in the original, that that was forged later. Um, but it depends on the Bible. I mean, you know, you go to, to a, the bookstore and, you know, you see my first Bible, it's, it doesn't get into any of this stuff. You know? right. um, it just depends on, on what your purpose is. A study Bible, it, a good one, will go into this kind of detail. Will it actually say the part that you said, like, how God actually says, I was not, I never met Jesus? Does it say that also? Yeah, I mean, that's that's in the actual verses where okay. it says that he didn't do them. Yeah, um, for, for Matthew, or excuse me, uh, Paul and Luke, at least. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as how these are dated, um, that, that's pretty basic, well-established, accepted scholarship. Um, that, that study Bibles will mention. Uh, it's, it's not like this information is unavailable. I mean, this is all on Wikipedia, too. It's just uh, people don't talk about it. And uh, the, the people who study this stuff don't, don't preach um, for their careers. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of them, uh, Bart Ehrman is a good example. He went to seminary, uh, originally uh, to Bible College, um, to become a preacher. And he figured out that he was pretty good at Greek and that he was interested in this kind of stuff and he went into higher criticism instead. Uh, that kind of thing isn't terribly uncommon. The people who get interested in this stuff and don't quit uh, become professors or scholars rather than teaching, uh, preaching. Um, the people who downplay this stuff or don't care about it or think that it's not true um, tend to go into preaching. And, uh, and some of them, um, just see it as a calling, just as their career that they're supposed to preach, and they don't really care. Uh, there's a, a pastor that I know um, who has a congregation of 3,000 plus people that he preaches to every week, who told me once that he had never read the Bible cover to cover. And I just, I, I mean, I'm not shocked, you know, but um, that kind of thing is more common than people think. Any other questions? Where would you guys like to go and eat? I love the Berg. Okay. We've got Brace for holiday room. Do I? <laughs> oh, yeah. My oh, yeah. Room. No, I changed my mind. this earlier. Yeah, Grace's laundry room. I'm not completely confident my laundry detergent is vegan. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, it works for me. You guys want to meet there in 10 minutes? I have no complaints. What do you say? No complaints here. Yeah, okay. I have fried I, mushrooms. It's convenient. So. Uh, yeah, I guess we're going to highlight we're going to guys. Um, I really appreciate it. Like I said, if you want copies of these slides, uh, email me. That's going to be easy. Um, I'm happy to give those to you. Also, I have uh, bumper stickers, and I've got some of these uh, carabiners. That's it. Maybe it's not so much. Help yourself. And thanks very much. Yeah, you did. Oh, it was like, where do you want to eat?